And welcome to the uh, second uh, Hampton E Talk that we've recorded. And today we're delighted to have Old Hamptonian Sam Rowley with us, and also Finn from the Upper Sixth, who is going to study biology. And I think Sam, you studied biology as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Finn is perfectly set up to ask the questions today. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Finn. And away cool. we go. Hi, Sam. Um, so it's clearly been a big year for you. Uh, what was it like winning the Lumix People's Choice Awards? Um, well, it was a bit of a dream come true, really. Um, yeah, it was. it's kind of been my ambition to feature in that competition ever since, well, probably for my first year at Hampton, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's been pretty overwhelming. Um, it was all pretty kind of quite shocking. Um, I remember when I first heard the news that I was kind of shortlisted in the top 25. Um, I was in the office and I I think I let out a little scream, um, <laughs> much to the delight of my colleagues, they found it quite funny. Um, but yeah, and then obviously finding out that I'd actually won out of the 25 images um, was, just, was just absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, I yeah. couldn't really imagine that was going to happen or really how to deal with <laughs> everything that happened afterwards, really. It was a uh, a whirlwind few days the photo went absolutely everywhere it went global um and yeah it was just overwhelming but also very exciting and yeah, I was very proud how long did it take you to actually get it take the shot um it was actually quite a short project compared to lots of the other ones that i kind of um done before um it was kind of like the idea was conceived only a few days before i actually went out and took it um it was essentially I was home in London for Christmas. So I'm based in Bristol now, um, but I was home in London. And I was looking for something to kill a bit of time in my two weeks holiday. Um, rather than sitting around. Um, so, yeah, um, while I was looking for ideas of London wildlife, um, which has been done to death by loads of photographers before, yeah. it's always quite tricky to find something original. Um, my, my friend actually texted me at two in the morning um, who uh, she took like a video of some mice that were running around her feet on a, um, a London tube station. And obviously I knew about this beforehand, but I never kind of clicked that that could be a really in interesting project to explore. Um, so that's kind of how it started. Um, and yeah, I've kind of got her to thank really. Um, and then I went down and um, night after night for five or six days and lay on my oh, belly wow. on um, the central London <laughs> station platforms. and. Hope that something interesting would happen in front of me. Thank God <laughs> Getting it weird looks from people walking by then. Yeah, d definitely a lot of strange looks. Um, <laughs> definitely, I would say the main challenge, it's quite a strange challenge to have as a wildlife photography project, but it was definitely like managing the people and like yeah. <laughs> trying to try, I, I guess, trying to politely brush them off because it was yeah. all quite distracting. And obviously, everyone at one in the morning, when they were a bit drunk, they've had a few drinks, are quite friendly as well. So, um, most of the project was just talking to random people <laughs> down there um one guy even thought that um i was in a bit of trouble so as you do when you're lying on your belly on a, a london tube station um uh he kind of saw me from the end of the platform ran over to me jumped on me and was like shaking me like, asking me if i was okay and obviously, I was like, yeah, obviously i'm fine and I, what's the issue and he was convinced that i'd had a heart attack or uh, something like that um so yeah, that was a very strange incident. Also, I don't really understand that if he did think I'd I had a heart attack, that jumping on me would be the best option. Yeah. Which I didn't ask him about at the time, but <laughs> since it's yeah. kind of dawned on me, it's a strange way to deal with it. Um, anyway, did you come up with the name? And then also, um, how did it? Has it changed your kind of like career a bit or life in any way beyond the actual just the kind of the winning of the award? Yeah. So the name I actually just kind of thought of in two seconds when I initially entered the photo, assuming that they would come up with a better name at some stage, but somehow it just survived the whole process. And then I saw it up on the wall and it was still called that stupid name that I came up with um, 10 o'clock at night a year ago when I entered the competition. So I don't know how that happened, but it did. Uh, so that's where that came from. <laughs> and um, yeah, and in terms of it changing, yeah, um, it was, I guess it's kind of died down a bit now, but if, for two weeks or so everything was kind of blowing up i was getting an enormous amount of emails people wanting to buy prints um yeah. you know just constant instagram messages and i think my followers went from like on instagram 800 to no something like a thousand to 20 what's it on now twenty eight thousand or something now 
in just a matter of days and it was constantly like just scrolling on your phone every second it would be more and more people it was yeah, it was pretty cool um but yeah it was it was just constant just requests and yeah I was just really busy for a few weeks having to also do my full-time job on top of that yeah, yeah because I just didn't expect that it would happen um so obviously you've been doing wildlife photography photography for quite a while now what's been like your best experience so far and your best place to visit um right so, okay uh my best experiences aren't actually always taking the photos it's actually kind of sh sh seeing people's reactions to the photos I mean that's what I've always tried to do it's always like try to you know try to infuse people about the natural world as much as I am and yeah. I think the best means to do that is via my photography so it sounds corny but I would say definitely actually one of the best experiences was giving an assembly at Hampton back or oh, 20 2015 maybe just about some of my adventures and some of my photos and um yeah I really kind of enjoyed the experience and kind of engaging with that many people who I'm um, entertained by the whole thing so that was like a really nice um, yeah. experience definitely um in terms of stuff in the field probably the most exciting time I've had is in a small town in Ethiopia called Hara um where I, I, I went for a few days after a film shoot um and photographed hyenas there that are kind of like our red foxes around London they're quite tame and they're found everywhere okay. but these things are, are enormous they're like five times the size of a fox um <laughs> their heads or their mouth you could fit like a human skull inside and these things were like dogs they would jump up at you they would like beg you for food oh, um, really so it's just kind of the interaction with them was pretty pretty amazing and kind of like learning not to be as scared as I was initially as well kind of like overcoming that fear um like with all the locals laughing at you because you're screaming <laughs> and like running away from a hyena it was like a really nice experience um yeah so yeah that, that was amazing and I got some really um I got some photos that I was really pleased with as well so obviously that's that was a good perk yeah, sounds really good. Um, so like, when did your actual interest in like wildlife photography photography start? Did it start as you being interested in photography or wildlife, and one led to the other, or what really yeah. happened there? Yeah, it was definitely wild. It's always been kind of like wildlife for me is the main interest. And as I kind of alluded to before, it's kind of um, kind of sharing that excitement that I have for it with other people. And I found the best means to do that was via photography. And then, um, yeah, kind of got more and more serious to there, and I kind of enjoyed the creative process a bit more, and I kind of got hooked onto it that way. But um, yeah, certainly the wildlife kind of comes first. Is, yeah. So, like, where did it? How did you get to where you are now? So, did it start off as a hobby, and then when did you sort of realise that actually I want to take this further, and this is what I want to do um, more than just yeah. a hobby? Um, I guess it was actually featuring in this competition when I was, I think, twelve in the young categories um i took a I, I took some photos at q pond just my local pond when i was at hampton um none of which were any good whatsoever and somehow <laughs> i managed to take this photo um it was actually half decent and still probably one of my best photos that i've ever taken i'm pretty convinced it was i don't really remember it because it was so long ago but i'm pretty convinced it was a purely accidental um <laughs> and i put them all into this competition and yeah it got in and you know just going along to the natural history museum and meeting all these huge names of photography and them being so supportive and encouraging definitely kind of you know that kind of that, that that switch went off the back of my head that this could be um like a viable career this could be a viable um thing for me to um, pursue so they kind of start from there really and then just, i just kept doing it and doing it and getting more and more support and encouragement and getting better and better then it kind of spiraled on and then um i kind of made that leap into wildlife film which is what i'm doing in bristol which is pretty similar in terms of the principles. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's crazy to think that, you know, all of this can just start from one person saying a nice thing to you when you're 12 years old at the National Fishing Museum. It's, yeah, it's pretty cool to think, think that. Yeah. But, yeah. And so you've been on, like, you've had so many good opportunities. So you've been, I think it's the Galapagos, you said, and Madagascar. And how did those sort of opportunities arise um, to begin with? Yeah, um, so they were kind of, I guess me thinking outside the box a little bit it's very difficult for, to become I guess a professional wildlife photographer and just kind of get stuff handed to you on a plate um there's only two or three full-time um paid wildlife photography jobs in the world and they're all with National Geographic so it's pretty crazy so you, you can't need to do it all off your own back so those two were in my university summers the Galapagos I um a distant family friends friends there's a long 
connection is a biologist out in the Galapagos and he basically managed to land me a volunteer photographer role at a, a scientific foundation out, out there. So they paid for a lot of my expenses and they put me out for a couple of months and I basically just followed the scientists around and went off on all their expeditions around the islands, um, just taking photos of the whole process, which is really cool. Um, then the Madagascar one, I really want to do something really similar. Um, so I tried my luck and I emailed all 50, roughly 50 of the eco lodges that are out there um, and basically saying that I take photos, I can take photos to help promote your business um, in exchange for like flights and stuff. Can you, you know, can you um, do this? I got one reply out, out of 50, <laughs> literally one reply. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that managed to come to fruition and I was out. Yeah, I've got to spend about a month out there, which is amazing out, out, out in the jungle. So yeah, it's definitely thinking a bit outside the box to get these to get these opportunities sometimes because everyone wants to do it. So it's really yeah. quite so festive. what's what sort of next to you at the moment? What's what project are you on or looking forward to at the moment? Obviously the situation right now. Yeah. Don't need for a little much, but yeah. What um, well, I'm actually I've actually managed to kind of sustain a project while during lockdown. So there's a cemetery at the end of my road where I've been kind of doing my daily exercise in. Um but there is a, a family of badgers and also a, a family of foxes as well that have kind of found their home in and amongst these like old Gothic Victorian grey stones, which is really cool. So like they're kind of popping out and they're occasionally digging some quite unsavoury items, as I'm sure you can imagine, like underneath these gravestones every now and then, which I've had to call the uh, the grave digger about and he's come and like reburied. Them. But there's been some pretty horrific stuff that's been cut, that's kind of come up. But it's a pretty am amazing story to think that like there's, that, that there's all this life in a place which is you know um sort of it's a lot of death i guess so yeah it's a pretty cool project i'm still waiting for that money shot but it basically involves me going out for my walk every day putting the cameras out which is like a camera trap system so uh the cameras are automatically triggered if an animal walks past them essentially so it means that i don't have to sit um for hours in in the field getting these shots that you know the technology can do it for me um so i've managed to do that throughout this whole process which has been quite important. Just on the the kind of with the lockdown um, at the moment, and there's been lots of inf kind of, you know, watching. I've actually watched a bit of Spring Watch <laughs> as in, yeah. in lockdown. But you know, talking about wildlife returning to urban environments, mm. is that have you managed to kind of witness any of that, or is that something that we think that yeah. people are kind of more conscious of now? Or um, I do think there's an element of people um, kind of kind of. Uh, it's quite a popular news story that wildlife is returning so quickly. I don't think it's been the case in everything that's been reported. I, mm. I know that there's some instance where people have used old images and videos from wildlife in the city, which I've seen before and people are saying this has just happened, but it isn't true. But there's definitely some instance where wildlife is kind of returning to places where you wouldn't expect them to. So on the Spring Watch shoot recently, I was actually doing a recce for one of the new live locations where they're going to kind of station all the presenters and do the and have the main base and stuff from um a place in Wales and it was like a really well trodden quite busy nature reserve up mm -hmm. until obviously a month or two ago um and I don't know if, if you know what a tawny owl is it's one of the British species I think there's only about 10,000 of them anyway um I was just walking along the path and no one had been there for for two months it was really eerie it was it was it was a bit of a ghost town you go in the hides and all the log books would be full of bird sightings and then it just stopped on like whenever it was the 14th of March and there was nothing yeah. um so it was quite eerie and there was a tawny owl actually sitting um at eye level which is pretty unheard of on the like on the branch over the path on the main path of the nature reserve which you would never normally see um so I guess it's yeah that's a good example of wildlife like reclaiming areas where you wouldn't expect them to but um yeah it'll be interesting to see how that's sustained when everything starts getting busier again and if people are more conscious of making room for wildlife and stuff as well um, I have no idea what's going to happen with that but hopefully people will have seen the light a little bit.